Chapter 1 The travelers left and entered our car at every stopping of the train. Three persons, however, remained bound, like myself, for the farthest station, lady neither young nor pretty, smoking cigarettes with a thin face, cap on her head, bearing a semi-masculine outer garment. Then her companion, very loquacious gentleman of about forty years, with baggage entirely new and arranged in an orderly manner. Then a gentleman who held himself entirely aloof, short in stature, very nervous, of uncertain age, with bright eyes, not pronounced in color, but extremely attractive, eyes that darted with rapidity from one object to another. These gentlemen, during almost all the journey thus far, had entered into conversation with no fellow traveler, as if he carefully avoided all acquaintance. When spoken to, he answered curtly and decisively, and began to look out of the car window obstinately. Yet it seemed to me that the solitude weighed upon him. He seemed to perceive that I understood this, and when our eyes met, as happened frequently, since we were sitting almost opposite each other, he turned away his head, and avoided conversation with me as much as with the others. At nightfall, during a stop at a large station, a gentleman with the fine baggage, lawyer, as I have since learned, got out with his companion to drink some tea at the restaurant. During their absence, several new travelers entered the car, among whom a tall old man, shaven and wrinkled, evidently a merchant, wearing large heavily lined cloak and big cap. This merchant sat down opposite the empty seats of the lawyer and his companion, and straight away entered into conversation with the young man, who seemed like an employee in some commercial house, and who had likewise just boarded the train. At first the clerk had remarked that the seat opposite was occupied, and the old man had answered that he should get out at the first station. Thus their conversation started. I was sitting not far from these two travelers, and as the train was not in motion, I could catch bits of their conversation when others were not talking. They talked first of the prices of goods and the condition of business. They referred to a person whom they both knew. Then they plunged into the fair at Nijni Novgorod. Clerk boasted of knowing people who were leading a gay life there, but the old man did not allow him to continue, and interrupting him, began to describe the festivities of the previous year at Kunavina, in which he had taken part. He was evidently proud of these recollections, and probably thinking that this would detract nothing from the gravity which his face and manners expressed, he related with pride how, when drunk, he had fired at Kunavina such a broadside that he could describe it only in the other's ear. The clerk began to laugh noisily. Old men laughed too, showing two long yellow teeth. Their conversation not interesting me, I left the car to stretch my legs. At the door I met the lawyer and his lady. You have no more time, the lawyer said to me. The second bell is about to ring. Indeed, I had scarcely reached the rear of the train when the bell sounded. As I entered the car again, the lawyer was talking with his companion in an animated fashion. The merchant sitting opposite them was taciturn. And then she squarely declared to her husband, said the lawyer with a smile as I passed by them, that she neither could nor would live with him, because, and he continued, but I didn't hear the rest of the sentence, my attention being distracted by the passing of the conductor and a new traveler. When silence was restored, I again heard the lawyer's voice. The conversation had passed from a special case to general considerations. And afterward comes discord, financial difficulties, disputes between the two parties and the couple separate. In the good old days that seldom happens, is it not so? asked the lawyer of the two merchants, evidently trying to drag them into the conversation. Just then the train started, and the old man, without answering, took off his cap and crossed himself three times while muttering a prayer. 
When he had finished, he clapped his cap far down on his head and said, Yes, sir, that happened in former times also, but not as often. In the present day it is bound to happen more frequently. People have become too learned. The lawyer made some reply to the old man, but the train, ever increasing its speed, made such a clatter upon the rails that I could no longer hear distinctly. As I was interested in what the old man was saying, I drew nearer. My neighbor, the nervous gentleman, was evidently interested also, and without changing his seat, he lent an ear. But what harm is there in education? asked the lady with a smile that was scarcely perceptible. Would it be better to marry as in the old days when the bride and the bridegroom did not even see each other before marriage? She continued, answering as is the habit of our ladies, not the words that her interlocutor had spoken, but the words she believed he was going to speak. Women did not know whether they would love or would be loved. They were married to the first comer and suffered all their lives. Then you think it was better so? She continued, evidently addressing the lawyer and myself, and not at all the old men. People have become to learn, repeated the last, looking at the lady with contempt and leaving her question unanswered. Should be curious to know how you explain the correlation between education and conjugal differences, said the lawyer with a slight smile. The merchant wanted to make some reply, but the lady interrupted him. No, those days are past. The lawyer cut short her words. Let him express his thought. Because there is no more fear, replied the old man. But how will you marry people who do not love each other? Only animals can be coupled at the will of a proprietor. But people have inclinations and attachments, the lady hastened to say, casting a glance at the lawyer, at me, and even at the clerk who, standing up and leaning his elbow on the back of his seat, was listening to the conversation with a smile. You're wrong to say that, madam, said the old man. The animals are beasts, but man has received the law. But nevertheless, how is one to live with a man when there is no love, said the lady, evidently excited by the general sympathy and attention. Formerly no such distinctions were made, said the old man gravely. Only now have they become a part of our habits. As soon as the least thing happens, the wife says, I release you, I'm going to leave your house. Even among the Mojiks, this fashion has become acclimated. There, she says, here are your shirts and rovers. I'm going off with Vanka. His hair is curlier than yours. Just go talk with them. And yet, the first rule for the wife should be fear. Clerk looked at the lawyer, the lady, and myself, evidently repressing a smile, and all ready to deride or approve the merchant's words according to the attitude of the others. What fear? said the lady. This fear, the wife must fear her husband, that is what fear. Of oh, that, my little father, that is ended. No, madam, that cannot end. As she, if the woman was taken from man's ribs, so she will remain unto the end of the world, said the old man, shaking his head so triumphantly and so severely that the clerk, deciding that the victory was on his side, burst into a loud laugh. Well, you men think so, replied the lady without surrendering and turning towards us. You have given yourself liberty. As for a woman, you wish to keep her in this irregular. To you everything is permissible, isn't it so? Oh, man, that's another affair. Then, according to you, to man everything is permissible. No one gives him this permission. Only if the man behaves badly outside, the family is not increased thereby. But the woman, the wife, is a fragile vessel, continued the merchant severely. His tone of authority evidently subjugated his hearers. Even the lady felt crushed, but she didn't surrender. Yes, but you will admit, I think, that a woman is a human being and has feelings like her husband. What should she do if she doesn't love her husband? If she doesn't love him, repeated the old man stormily and knitting his brows, why she will be made to love him. This unexpected argument pleased the clerk, and he uttered a murmur of approbation. Oh, no, she will not be forced, said the lady. 
where there is no love one cannot be obliged to love in spite of herself and if the wife deceives her husband what is to be done said the war that shouldn't happen said the old man he must have his eyes about him and if it does happen all the same you will admit that it does happen it happens among the upper classes not among us answered the old man and if any husband is found who is such a fool as not to rule his wife he will not have robbed her but no scandal nevertheless love or not but don't disturb the household every husband can govern his wife he has the necessary power it is only the imbecile who doesn't succeed in doing so everybody was silent clerk moved advanced and not wishing to lag behind the others in the conversation began with his external smile yes in the house of our employer scandal has a reason and it's very difficult to view the matter clearly the wife loved to amuse herself and began to go astray he's capable a serious man first it was with the bookkeeper the husband tried to bring her back to reason through kindness she didn't change her conduct she plunged into all sorts of business she began to steal his money he beat her but she grew worse and worse to an unbaptized to a pagan to a jew saving your permission she went in succession for her careers what could the employer do he dropped her entirely now he lives as a bachelor as for her she's dragging in the depth he's an imbecile said the old man if from the first he had not allowed her to go in her own fashion had kept a firm hand upon her she would believe in honestly no danger liberty must be taken away from the beginning do not trust yourself to your horse up on the highway do not trust yourself to your wife at home at that moment the conductor passed asking for the tickets for the next station the old man gave up his yeah the feminine sex must be dominated in season else all will perish and you yourself at kunavina did you not lead a gay life with the pretty girls asked the lawyer with a smile oh that's another matter said the merchant severely good-bye he added rising he wrapped himself in his cloak lifted his cap and taking his bag left the car